introduce you, Aunt of St. Cloud um, from the Kingdom of Lahar, uh, who is teaching a class on Spotter's Guide to Iberian Ceramics. Thank you very much, Sophia. I um, appreciate your help facilitating this and welcome to everybody who's joining us from various kingdoms now and into the future. Um, welcome to this class, Spotter's Guide to Iberian Ceramics. Uh, go through a little bit about me uh, and then we'll talk about different ceramic concepts, some glaze language, lustreware technology, uh, the lustreware timeline, uh, lustreware for export and how to spot a fake. So a little bit about me, I am a geologist by trade and I dabble in ceramics um, and with a focus on glazing as part of my SCA hobby. Um, I first fell in love with Middle Eastern lustreware, uh, which you can see on the left of the image there. And then I quickly developed a, a passion for Spanish ceramics as well, um, which have beautiful intricate detail. So that's where we've ended up here. Um, a couple of ceramic terms to start with. Uh, greenware is unfired dry clay. So these are objects that have been formed and shaped. Um, and if you don't like it, you can throw it back in the bucket and it dissolves. Um, to turn that into a stronger bit of material, you then bisque fire it. So that's a low temperature firing. The body is still porous. Um, so this is similar to what terracotta pots are. Um, this makes it stronger. It means it can absorb glaze easily and it makes the glazing process easier. You don't have to bisque fire objects. You can go straight from greenware, put some glaze on it, and then do your final firing. Um, but it pre-shrinks the ceramics and that reduces the likelihood that your ceramic and your glaze will shrink at different rates. And it helps reduce the chances of the glaze flaking off. Earthenware is a type of clay. So it can be fired between 700 to 1000 degrees. Um, it is slightly porous and will have a reasonably low shrinkage. So earthenware needs to be sealed with glaze to make it essentially food safe or in our terms, microwave and dishwasher safe. Um, stoneware goes to higher between 1200 and 1300 degrees Celsius. Um, when the stoneware fires, the glaze part of the, sorry, the clay particles, uh, start to vitrify, which means that they start to melt and they weld themselves together. So if you have stoneware clay and you fire it at a proper temperature, you actually don't need to glaze it. It will resist absorbing water. Uh, the next definition is stone paste or fritware. So this is more of a glass and silica dominate material. And then it's had a bit of clay put in it. So it's malleable and is, can be molded. Um, it's harder to work with, um, but can be stronger and more resistant once you fire it. The final type of clay is porcelain clay. So the Chinese developed this. It gets fired at a very hot temperature, 1300 degrees or stronger. Um, and once it's fired, it is very strong and it is very light. And so once this was on the medieval markets, this was highly prized, uh, prized objects um, and they were highly traded as well. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of knockoff versions of porcelain going around and people trying to make earthenware versions of the same thing. Um, the problem with earthenware is if you fire it at porcelain temperatures and you manage to get your kiln hot enough, it will actually slump and run all over your kiln. So some clays will only ever be earthenware um, and you can't just keep increasing the temperature to get a stronger body out of it. So an example on the picture there, that is a stoneware clay. Uh, in terms of glaze, this is the usually siliceous or silica rich medium that you coat your body with. Um, there's various ways to do this. First is underglaze. So this is just colorant that you add. It doesn't melt and recrystallize, so it won't seal your clay body. Um, it will bond with it, but it doesn't have that glassy shine that you want to make it water resistant. You can apply this to both greenware or bisque, or, and it can be fired at the same time as a glaze layer. So you can underglaze paint, then put a clear glaze over the top and fire them both at the same time. 
glaze is coloured or clear um, and it binds with the ceramic body and it seals the pores and it makes it cookware. You can do that as a single firing, as I said earlier, but it is a lot safer for your body if you fire it once into bisque and then you fire it with your glaze as a second stage. It makes the guessing work around shrinkage a lot easier. Overglaze occurs once you've got your seal glaze, it's come out of the kiln, you apply a second, third, fourth coat of glaze, and then you refire it. You need to refire it at a lower temperature to make sure your first glaze doesn't run and melt and go all over the shop. Um, but you also have to be quite careful about the atmosphere in which you refire. Uh, you can discolor the first glaze if you're not careful. So in the image we have on the right there is a bowl uh, from Valencia. It has a cobalt blue underglaze applied. It then has a white um, uh, glaze. So it's a tin oxide glaze. And then it also has some luster overglaze. Most glaze in period was a lead glaze. This allows it to run. Um, and it's a glossy transparent glaze. And you can tint that with various materials such as copper or manganese. Um, it's usually utilized on greenware or bisque and it can be fired at the same time. Tin glaze refers to a lead glaze in which tin is added and this makes it opaque. So it gives you that nice creamy white background that from a distance will look a lot like porcelain and that's really the aim of this was developed in Iran um, as a style and then it quickly traveled across Europe from there. A couple other terms, lusterware is tin oxide, so that creamy white glaze. And then we have an overglaze applied to that. So you apply metallic compounds and when you fire that, the metal runs slightly and becomes glossy. And then you rub off the, the oxide that's left, the residue that's left, and you get a nice shiny um, work of art. Typically, uh, lusterware needs a reducing kiln, so you need to remove as much oxygen from that as possible. Um, and this can affect colours. So your colour palette is quite restricted if you do a second luster glaze firing. Maolica, on the other hand, which was the other very popular ceramics out of Italy at the time, um, uses coloured stains and oxides on an opaque white tin glaze. And so they had a reasonably limited colour palette until the 16th and 17th centuries. But that was your main local competition for the Spanish and Portuguese uh, lusterware. So to put the colours and the, the chemistry into context, here is a panel of uh, copper experiments. So you can see as the copper percentage increases from zero to five percent, which isn't very much, you get a depth of colour change. And as you go up the scale, the um, LPG gas or the reduced atmosphere uh, increases. So you're removing oxygen from the atmosphere um, and you get a reducing phase and the colour of that copper changes. So if you have a strong copper uh, percent, and it crystallizes in a reducing atmosphere, you'll get a red tone. Whereas if it's in its oxygen atmosphere, you'll get a green tone. If you add that copper to an alkali base and it forms copper uh, dicopper oxide, or Cu2O, you'll get a blue to turquoise color. So depending on your chemistry, uh, it depends on what glaze color you have. Cobalt, on the other hand, is a very stable colour and it will produce blue right through the temperature spectrum and the oxidisation and reduction spectrum. So this is why cobalt was featured a lot on porcelain ceramics because it was essentially the only colour that was stable at the high temperatures you need to fire porcelain at at the time, which is where you got the typical blue and white ceramics from China. So this is why we have cobalt often featuring in lusterware because if you use blue, you can pretty much guarantee it will stay blue no matter how you change the oxygen ratios in your kiln. 
So luster metallic uh, compounds are applied to your tinglays and they use organic binders which cook out. So if you use too much uh, gum arabic or other binders, as that cooks out, as with charcoal, it will consume oxygen. So you can actually accidentally change the oxygen levels in your kiln by putting too much binder in your glaze. The Iberian ceramics used silver and copper for their luster. Um, if you use gold, you actually get like a rosy lavender color and they were aiming for that nice glossy gold color, similar to what you can see on this Kashadi bowl. Um, and to achieve that, what you need is microparticles of silver and copper, carefully layered and balanced. Um, they also used cinnabar, which is mercury, and that helps uh, the glaze flow and makes it keeps the surface even, um, and it helps the chemistry. As you fire these, and depending on what your source of copper is, what micro contaminants that you have in your deposit, um, what deleterious elements you might have, will slightly alter your colours. And so as you dig deeper in your geological deposit, the type of copper that you have from very rich supergene ore down to chalcopyrite ore, you'll change how your copper will come out. So it might be contaminated with pyrite, might have a small amount of gold associated. There are various contaminants that you'll find at different layers in your mine. So as your source changes, so must your glaze. So here's two variations you can see on the screen. Both of these are from about the same time period at location. You can see they've gone for a brown gold luster and more of a slightly orange luster. These two examples are from Manassees um, in Spain, and this is a red luster variation. So you can achieve this by layering on additional material. So there's extra copper here, which gives it that beautiful red tone. So one of the important things in luster is restricting the oxygen from um, getting to your glaze as it's setting. So to do this, you have to glaze both the front and the back of your object. So previously, um, if you're only using a copper-based glaze, you can get away with just glazing the surface. It's going to be used for the food and leave the back naked. Um, but for luster wear, you need to glaze both sides. So you'll often see the back highly decorated as is the front um, and it has the tin oxide glaze as well. So this is a, a classic example um, from the Valencian uh, schools with uh, a very light floral decoration in the luster. And we, I've zoomed in there, it's a small chip missing uh, on the corner of the plate. And you can see that the clay body itself is actually a dark brownish color. And this is hidden really well by that creamy oxide glaze. And that glaze prevents the oxygen from transmitting through the plate and tarnishing or coloring the luster as it's applied. This is another cup that I used at the front of my presentation. Um, so this is from about 1400. You can see that they have a very thick application of luster on the handles. So it's gone a dark red where the application of the luster on the inside and around the blue areas is a little lighter. So that gives you your kind of yellow brown luster. And both of these sections will still glint and glow as you rotate the piece around. You just get a slight different color because of that thickness. And they've made it thicker on the handles because that's the bit that's going to be used. So it's more likely to be damaged and it needs to stand up to wear a bit better. And you can see from the scratches that this object has been used and it's scratching back the, the luster to the um, tin glaze underneath and that's reasonably well undamaged. What you can also see in this image is the cobalt, which would have been applied prior to the luster firing, has been applied too thick, and it's actually flaked sections off and it's lifted pieces up. And this only affects this cup where the cobalt is present. So this will either be because the cobalt has been applied too thickly, or it's possible that the cobalt had some unknown contaminants in it, um, and so when they did the reduction fire, those contaminants reacted with the reducing atmosphere and produced these results. Majority of the cobalt 
um, used in the Middle Ages was sourced from Iran. So it's a reasonably pure source and they exported it uh, right through to China. They exported it through uh, most of Europe as well. If you have a question, um, how do you stop the foot from sticking if the surfaces are all covered? Is there like a wax resist or something? That's a great question. So you can see here, I've just flicked back a couple of pages. Um, it's slightly flanked off around the foot. So you've got a couple of choices. You can either clean off the foot and hope that your glaze doesn't run too much. Um, or you can put it on little pins and then what you end up doing is having small pock marks in your glaze rather than having the foot naked. Um, it's a bit of a risk. There are multiple directions you can go with this. I'll just move forward to the next slide. In this one, you can see the cobalt has been applied and has started to run. And the direction of the cobalt running indicates that the plate was sitting either upright or slightly tilted at the time, or that the edges are actually quite um, uh, angular. What's interesting about this plate is that the cobalt has run, but the luster hasn't. And the luster has been applied after the cobalt material has come out of the kiln. And so that tells us that even though the cobalt isn't perfect, the amount of effort and the resources invested in making this plate in the kiln and the charcoal and the multiple stages of firing was still valuable enough to continue and to finish the luster part of the decoration, um, even though the cobalt wasn't perfect. So it tells you a lot about the value of not only the finished plate, but the cost involved in getting it halfway through the process. So lusterware uh, was developed in Iraq. Um, and then it was uh, the center of production moved to the Fatima dynasty um, in Fustat. And so here's an example of the Egyptian luster. And so they had a brighter gold color. And this could be because a lot of their minerals were coming from evaporites. And so they have a different formation methodology. In 1168, uh, fortunately, Fustat was burnt to the ground. And then we had a, a diaspora and the Muslim uh, crafts people went to both uh, Syria, Iraq, um, mostly Syria, Iran and Spain. And so we get this spread of crafts people who've got similar knowledge and similar symbology, taking their ideas and their methodology to new cultures. So to compare three of these uh, styles, this is Syrian lusterware. So locally, it's a little bit more of a yellow brown color, um, but they could achieve a dark bronzy brown as well. And you can see a lot of leaf ache designs and they're also using cobalt to highlight different objects. Uh, Kashani in uh, Iran, which is the source of our cobalt, you can see they've got figurative pieces, they're using a lot of texture fill, um, and they're also achieving that dark brown luster color. Whereas in Spain, at this same time in the uh, 13th to 14th century, Spain was still using basic earthenware colors. So these are typically copper and manganese, which are classic across most cultures. But you can see from these two objects, the intricacy of the artists um, and the master glazers knew their, their, their craft quite well. Um, if you apply copper too thick, it will run. If you apply it too thin, it gets a bit splodgy. It's quite a difficult beast. If you change the heat or the oxygen in the kiln, you will get manganese that turns slightly purple or you'll get manganese that chain turns slightly brown. So both of these being copper manganese, you can see there's a bit of a contrast there. This is a really good example from the 14th century in Spain as well. Beautiful, intricate designs with two colors used. So 
they already had the basis for what would become lustreware embedded in their design elements um, already. So the master craftsman knew how to work with a two-tone color palette already. The main hubs of lustreware production, which would become essentially Iberia's flagship ceramic style, were in Andalusia, um, Malaga in Granada, um, and Valencia. There was a smaller production hub in Catalonia, but from what I can see, they haven't produced as much that was widely available. Um, and I believe that the fact that they had massive shipping ports is what made it so widely accessible and exportable. The map on the screen um, is a soils map um, and I've adapted it from uh, Fraga 2014. So to make ceramics, you need clay and you need your glaze components. Obviously the glaze components with only three to 5% copper required, a lot lighter and a lot easier to transport, but you, your mineral breadth needs to be a lot more. So to create ceramics, you really need to set up your shop where your clay is, because that's going to be the least transportable object. So you want a reasonably sticky clay and you need to know that it's going to fire at the temperatures that you're looking for. If it's got too much organic matter in it, it will burn off and become too porous, or it might affect the oxygen uh, levels in your kiln. Um, so you kind of want to set up shop somewhere close to where all of the pink on that map is. And then you want it to be close to a port so you can export and you can get your glaze materials. Luckily in Iberia, they have many uh, mines that were utilized from the Roman times onwards um, for various minerals. So key ones there, the Rio Tinto deposit, which is actually a full belt of deposits, extends all the way over to San Sao Domingos. That's um, volcanic massive sulfites, so that produces a, a lot of copper material. Almaden is, uh, produces um, mercury, which is where our cinnabar comes from, and there are various lead and zinc and tin deposits as well throughout uh, Iberia. And they've been utilised since, on and off, since the Roman times. The ceramics themselves were created for quite a broad range of markets. So on the right hand side here, we have a classic uh, Valencian style plate and the internal um, calligraphy is a sedna. So it's um, a Jewish plate for the Jewish market. Whereas on the left hand side, we have a um, Valencian plate which features the heraldry of an Italian family. So we know that these were being made deliberately for an export market, as well as the internal market. This is an example of a classic style of plate, uh, gedruntware. So gedruns are the lumps that are kind of raised and tapered. And there's usually a inner raised boss in the middle that will often have heldry or an important symbol on it. So these objects appear to have been made with molds or slip casts. So the liquid clay is poured into a mold and then it starts to dry, you pour it off and you get repetitions of the same thing. And so this means that your ceramics can be mass produced and fired separate to your glazing um, team. So you actually end up with a split of craftspeople, one group of potters focusing on the making of the objects, and then your glazers focusing on the decorating of objects. So an example uh, can be seen here where you can see the ripples in the luster outline the gadroons, but the design that's been applied doesn't follow the shape that they were given. So you often see this where the glazers want to deviate from the mass produced blank and they, they start creating their own uh, direction. So here we've got Latin words so for a local market. Design influences are quite strong uh, from the Muslim crafts people 
brought their design influences and ideas um, to all of the hubs that they started. Um, and you can see here, these are luster and cobalt tiles from Kashan. And they've got the folate designs, they've got a few animals, and then they've got beautiful Kulfic text around them. We can see a lot of those designs and those elements replicated or mirrored in the work that the artists in Valencia were producing. Um, so these are two uh, albaralos or drug jars. Sorry if I mispronounced that one. Um, they often are listed as having pseudo kulfic text on them, uh, which I think is kind of a Western way of looking at it because kulfic text is often utilized as artwork as well. It conveys a message, but it's designed in such a way that it becomes the message. So it's the decorative object and writing at the same time. So some things listed as pseudo kulfic might not actually be pseudo kulfic they might actually be written language it's just it's not being looked at by a native speaker um, so here we can see the pseudo kulfic text which are the two bands of writing on there but if we go look at two plates we can see what's listed as alafia in their uh, met museum listings and that's these blue lines of text between the palms um, and around the outside. And that's a blessing for health and happiness. And you see those text pieces turn up on those drug jars a lot, um, often referred to as pseudo kulfic even though it's being translated as actual written language. So a lot of the museum items that I have linked um, do need their details updated as new research comes in. It's just, they have a lot of objects, so it's taking them a while, I guess. So this is an example of styles from Catalonia. Um, so this is a 16th century Catalonian dish. You can see a bird featured there. It's very thick glaze, so they go for the dark red luster. Um, it's been applied with a very heavy hand. The background is quite open behind it. There's not a lot of small, intricate detail. And when you compare that to a similar bird um, created in Valencia, you can see the fine line work um, that is exemplifies the Valencian art. Here's another example from Catalonia, very heavy on the luster, so there's barely any light. Um, they don't seem to be as skilled in the light dark contrast as uh, the other two ceramic hubs. Um, and even the back of the artwork is very heavy with the luster. There's barely any white space behind it. Um, they've left some lines and textures, but mostly they're aiming, seem to aim for an entire plate that will just shine at you. If we compare this to what's coming out of Manassees, um, same level of luster, but the fine detail is much more um, significant. Uh, you'll be forgiven for thinking that bulls were a uh, significant feature. Uh, this is because the um, leading family of the time had bulls as their heraldry. So you'll see them turn up in a lot of Valencian plates of the time. Um, I particularly like the kind of derp look that some of them have where their horns don't quite work. But here are two examples of the intricate uh, fill space that you'll see at Valencian work. So here again, you can see the intricate fill has developed over time. So on the left from the 1400s, we have a jug, drug jar with the starting of that fill work, um, small square panels, swells, lines, and floral vine work. And then the extreme uh, end of like 1500s, we have super intricate um, detail. And so this would have been painted on with a couple of hairbrush um, by hand, and then the dots done uh, secondary to that. It takes forever. But floral fill was a thing. 
and it was uh, frequently used just general floral stuff. Um, because the cobalt needs to be painted first and then fully fired before you can do your luster wear, the cobalt design chosen really controls what your luster wear can become after that. So on the left, we have a reasonably mathematical mirrored pattern. Um, this is reasonably unusual. Typically, the patterns are more likely on say, similar to the one on the right, where the light dark balance is right, but the layout of the floral designs just kind of fit around the cobalt motif. Another example of a common motif, uh, I call it stylized flowers. I haven't found a specific reference to what this particular dot work design is. Um, they tend to be three, four or five uh, lobe flowers um, and they're just a, a pattern fill. So dots and stripes, it's very easy. It can be created very fast. Um, so it's quite a, uh, a good pattern if you're doing mass production and it can be scaled up and down. So you can see one example without dragon um, and the Ava Maria plate. And then on the other side, you can see stylized flowers, which might have worked with some of the previous designs on the previous slide. But here they've used the dot flower fill um, design. The other design that you will commonly see is a cobalt featured design. So the key part of the design is done in cobalt first. And then after the luster is more just to give it a bit of bling um, and fill in a little bit of detail in the background. So the main star of this plate is the cobalt as opposed to the luster. Um, this isn't necessarily a financial decision because cobalt isn't necessarily cheaper to use and apply than the luster itself. It's just a decorative choice. My final uh, design I'm going to show you is the Valencian leaf pattern. So this one is a common pattern, um, usually alternating between luster and cobalt leaves. Um, the one on the left-hand side seems to be a slightly earlier design than the one on the right-hand side, which is more rounded and tapered. Um, cleaner lines, and you can see two slightly different colored um, lusters. So your slightly earlier brownish one um, versus your redder, thicker one. And so this is a classic Valencian design as well. And this is how you can spot a fake. So this is a fake Valencian leaf pattern um, produced in Tuscany. So this is an example of the potters in Tuscany didn't have the technology or chose not to have the technology to do luster wear because it would have required revamping their kilns to reduce the oxygen flow. Um, and that would move away from the path that uh, Italy was following, which was down the multiple color path. Um, so they've created a fake uh, by giving it some really heavy dark brown manganese leaves in place of where you'd expect the luster leaves to be. And so one way of knowing that this is a fake, if you're looking at it online, is the fact that the manganese has sort of run slightly and is dripping and you wouldn't expect your lusters to run like that because they essentially are stuck on and then they weld. Um, the other way that you know that this is a fake is the fact that they've got yellow on there. So the yellow would probably uh, dye or change color and become brown or contaminated during uh, a luster reduced atmosphere firing. So the fact that the yellow is there suggests that the brown isn't a dark brown luster, it's a dark brown manganese glaze. I highly recommend, there are a lot of research papers out there looking at the use of cobalt and different recipes for luster um, and some amazing um, research that's been done. Here is a short list of the ones that I have specifically used in this presentation.
and a short list of websites um, where I've gotten all of my images. So I will open this up to questions now. So you have about 10 minutes and we do have a question in the chat. Um, this is going to be on the greenware, which was before the maps. Um, in the Kashani pieces, the surface wasn't flat on the left. Was it carved as green as greenware? Something else? Uh, these ones? I assume so. Uh, so these one, uh, the fritware on the left is, um, so that's the stoneware fritware. So I believe this is actually a moulded piece. So they've taken um, a, a mould of an existing uh, piece and then they've pushed fritware clay into it. It's a thicker, heavier clay, so it will hold those lumps and swells a little better and be less likely to kind of melt in the kiln. So this is a deliberate design choice and you often see Kashani ware is molded or cast. Um, the tiles are often raised as well um, and that's because they've pushed the material into a mold before it dried. I hope that answered your question. There are no other questions within the chat. And yes, there was a thank you to, uh, to the response. And someone has a pondering. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, waiting for it to come up or, yes, you can unmute. Go ahead and unmute. Uh -huh. Hello, it's Stanzi on Gabster's account because he's now looking in the room so I could attend this class. I'm wondering whether, because you showed the um, the chunky Valencians, oh, was it? No, it was uh, Catalan stuff in the 17th century. Chunky, 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 um, where there was not much light. Mm, yeah, but there was another one that was, yeah, that's them. All right, so I'm just looking at that time frame. I'm wondering whether or not the impact of the Moriscos being expelled in the 17th century by the king has had an impact on the skills available at the time. Highly that's likely. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great pondering. Yeah, highly likely. The um, expulsion uh, meant that the ceramic works did shut down for a period of time, but they were quickly restarted by the Christians. Um, mm. Catalonia wasn't known to be a huge production hub, though. So, oh, that's true because it would have been more uh, Valencia or in the yeah further south, yeah. which was under the control of Aragon, I think. Yeah. So I think it would have had an impact, um, but I don't actually have enough references for Catalonian to track the change over time, um, and. My references for Valencia abruptly stopped about the time that the crafts people got kicked out. And we have another question in the chat specifically regarding the Catalonia pieces. Um, does that look like, and I am going to horribly mispronounce this word, segrafito on the back on the Catalonian pieces? Ah, so uh, escrafito is the process by which you apply a glaze and then you scrape it off. Um, or you apply a full dip glaze and then you scrape it back to see the raw um, underneath. You can do that with luster, but because the, the gum Arabic and the other binders, um, they don't come off as cleanly. Uh, you can you end up with kind of a, a fuzzy edge to them because they're more flaky than fine powdery. Um, it could be, I believe this is more likely to be produced with a brush though, um, mostly because when you scrape things off, you can get very clean parallel lines. Whereas on some of these, you can see that they taper from the top to the bottom, suggesting you had a loaded brush that was drawn down and lifted off. I haven't seen much evidence for escrafito styles in the luster. 
And I believe that's because of the gum that they use. All right, have you got any recommendations to start looking for earlier wear prior to the workshop starting up in 1170? Uh, most of your earlier wear is going to be this style with the green um, copper and the manganese. Uh, so I would look for very similar decorative styles. The, the artistry didn't change. It was just the medium that shifted. Um, and yeah, manganese and copper would be prior to your luster wear centers. Okay. What's your favorite style? either to use or to make? Uh, at the moment, I don't have a kiln because I have moved states. So I can't make my own luster wear. Um, I am in love with cobalt, which is kind of how I got to the luster wear indirectly. Um, I, as a geologist, I currently work at a copper mine. So my favorite style at the moment is to use copper and make green objects using the minerals that I'm digging up out of the ground from my copper mine. Um, you can do it too if you go to tailings or an off-flow river from known mining areas. So if you went to Rio Tinto in Spain, you could get some of the clay and the stuff from the creek and you could use that to make green glazes. Right, we have about five minutes, but there is another question. Did they try underglaze luster and then overglaze to protect the metallic luster layer from oxy oxygenation? Um, that would require three firings though. So they would often do the tin glaze and then technically it's an underglaze when you apply the cobalt because the cobalt blend doesn't have silica in it. Um, it adopts the silica and kind of melds with the tin glaze. Um, and then the overglaze would be the luster. So if you then put um, another glaze on top to seal it, similar to, I guess, a varnish or something these days, um, it would need to melt at too high a temperatures and you'd run the risk of your luster would actually turn into little flakes of pure metal. And so you wouldn't end up with your copper oxides anymore. You, you change how they refract. So you can't get your luster too hot. So the luster wear actually doesn't tarnish um, very much at all. Most of the tarnishing you see are things like objects from Fustat, which have been in uh, acidic groundwater for a long period of time. And that luster wear tends to end up with like rainbow colors in it, which is really cool, but you don't see it kind of dulling like you do polished copper objects. There is a reference to green glazed bowls in cooking from across Arabic sources, Mamluk period. Any thoughts why a green glazed bowl would make a difference? Interesting. Um, I do know from my very limited uh, cooking experience that when you cook with copper implements and say you're making meringue, the meringue fluff is more likely to uh, stay upwards if you're using a copper whisk or a copper bowl. So that could relate to the same with a green glazed bowl. Um, it may be that green is a common colorant. It's rare to find clear if people could color it, they would. Um, so it might be that they're trying to distinguish between something like a tagine that's got no glaze on it versus a glazed object. But it's, a, it's a great question. I'm, I do not know a 100% definite answer. Um, there is a response in that. My understanding is that the cop copper is antibacterial. So maybe that is related? It could be. Um, if, if, your, if your food stays better in a particular bowl, you're going to keep using that style of bowl. No other comments in the comment box and we have two minutes. 
Well, then I'm going to use those two minutes to say thank you to Sophia for facilitating and thank you all for joining me. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording now.